Hey there, and welcome to the Fedora Podcast. This is episode 40. I'm your host, Eric the IT Guy Hendricks, and I seem to have been joined by an artificial intelligence of some sort. Noah, is that you? Hello, Eric. This is Noah. I have turned into a VU meter. I finally have proof that Noah is actually just an just an AI that exists online only. As the episode <laughs> rolls on, my my voice may change and become more naturally Noah and representative. Now, I just thought it'd be good for us to uh, keep an extra eye on our levels this week, Eric. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll try not to take that personally. But uh, so I, I understand you're you're a bit remote uh, tonight. You're you're not uh, you're not in your studio, which is why you're joining us semi virtually. I am. I'm on a secret mission, but right after Summit and joining us, uh, I think I'm real excited to talk about gaming on Linux, Eric. Yeah, it's been in a it's been a crazy few weeks. We're of course in the middle of the fall rush of conferences, announcements, and releases, and all that kind of thing. So uh, uh, we, as, as a result, we had pre-recorded this episode. So if you're if you're watching live. Uh, definitely uh, in, interact in the comments uh, after the fact, or you can even join us in our matrix room. Uh, but uh, so we're uh, and see, see, I, I even made a thing. You you can now just scan the QR code and it'll d drop you right into our matrix room. So That's join the uh, Fedora Podcast Matrix Room and uh, keep the conversation going. Uh, I'll be around on Tuesday uh, when this episode finally airs. But yeah, Noah mentioned we are talking about gaming on Linux. And I can think of no one better to have that conversation with than our very own Mr. Glorious Eggroll. Tom, welcome to the Fedora podcast. Hello, and thank you for having me. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, as I as I understand it, you just got back from a couple of conferences, uh, a couple of back to back, in fact. Uh, not not back to back, just Summit. Yeah, Summit was the one that I just came from. Uh, the one before that was way back in Mar uh, May. Anyway, is is scale scale and passage that was back in May, um, but yeah, I just got back from Summit. We did a booth there for Linux gaming. Uh, mm -hmm. I did a speech on well, a, a talk on uh, my new project Umu that we've been working on the last year. So uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun stuff. Awesome. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, for those who are unaware or who don't know who I am. Uh, my name is Tom Kreider. Uh, online, I go by Glorious Egg Roll. I work on, well, the original project that I most people know me from is from GE Proton, which is a fork of Proton that I've been maintaining pretty much since Proton launched. Um, I also am the creator and current maintainer of Novara Linux, which is a fork of Fedora. Um, I also, uh, as of recently, uh, well, I, I won't talk about that yet. I, 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 there's things that I need to clear up with some people first. But yeah, those are my two main projects. Um, I'm also a senior software maintenance engineer for Red Hat. That is my day job. And in terms of that, I kind of work on the, the Rive OS side currently, which is the uh, Red Hat in vehicle side. Hmm. Do you mind tying together a little bit for us the way that you approach in vehicle stuff? So you're working on hardware based things and coming up with software based solutions to kind of fit inside of there. Can you help draw kind of a parallel between the work that you're doing there, or the interests that overlap there with what you're doing with uh, with your with uh, Linux gaming? Honestly, uh, there's not really. A middle ground between there. They're two completely <laughs> separate things, and if anything, I keep my work pretty much completely separate from the gaming stuff. Uh, I've done the gaming mm. stuff for a really, really long time. Uh, it just so happened to be that once I started working for you know Red Hat, I I was already doing the gaming stuff. Um, okay, but with that being said. I am looking a lot more into the um, the ARM side of things as of recently, mm. which is pretty cool. Um, I had somebody that came up to the booth that's a, a friend of ours named uh, Tobias who works over at Canonical, and he, I, we, you know, we had our gaming booth set up and we had our demos and whatnot. So he comes over there with a brand new T14 uh, IBM ThinkPad, uh, one of the the new Snapdragon Gen three ones. Mm. And he drops it on the table and he goes, I got something for you to see. 
And so he flips it around after he drops it on the table, and I look at it, and it's running, it's running Portal through Proton, through Fex, on a Qualcomm Snapdragon. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, you just scratched the itch. So, yeah, now he's got me. I've got some, I've got some, some hardware that I'm working on. That's some art, arm hardware that I'm, I'm, I'm digging into right now. So work didn't inspire the the love for gaming. Can you tell us kind of what got you into doing this project? What inspired you to work on Proton? Uh, honestly, it was, well, for me, it started with Warframe originally. Uh, even before even before Proton existed, there I mean, there was at least DXVK, which had, was a very very fresh new project at that point, and a couple of other mm-hmm. projects, but mainly DXVK. And I had a ongoing little bash script for getting Warframe working in Linux at that time, and. Uh, I started bringing in DXVK when that was a thing, and then I started reporting bugs on when that wasn't working with Warframe to uh, get it working. And then from there, like within a year after I started doing that, Proton came up, and then mm. it was like, oh, here we go. So then I, you know, <laughs> obviously I forked Proton and kept it maintained, and that was that was kind of my just for uh, for maintaining my fork of Proton to start with. Um, the thing that really kind of made it blow up and also the reason that I made Novara is because I wanted something that my dad could use. So my dad, mm-hmm. he's a, you know, he's a PC gamer and pretty much his day in and day out is go to work, come home and then just pop in a chair and relax and play some, some PC games. And there were more than a handful of times where he would go to play a game and at, at that point he was on windows and either windows would crash or windows would have some kind of problem and i'd have to go over there and spend a weekend fixing his computer and mm. then it came to it came to a point where i think at one point windows pushed an update just borked his his usb keyboard like it was a standard old usb keyboard and it just completely stopped working for some reason. I mean, to this day, I don't think we ever figured out why it happened, but after I reinstalled, I did reinstall Windows to get it working, but then went and went back on that decision and decided, okay, no, what we're going to do is, this works for now, but we're going to get all of the games that you play. So I got a list of games that he plays. I went through every single one of them to check Linux compatibility and like most of them play fine on Linux. So at that point, that was also before I started on, uh, started working for Red Hat. I got him started at that point on what was Antergos Linux, which is Arch Linux. Mm -hmm. That's I was using Arch and that was the easiest way to get Mm -hmm. him gaming on it. (laughs) So I started him on Antergos and that's what it was, GE Proton and Intergos. And then, you know, I ended up getting hired by Red Hat, moved to Fedora, wanted something Fedora based that was easier to use and didn't and you know, also Intergos had died out pretty much like right after that point. And uh then that's when Novara came into play. What a cool oh, story. That's... So it started with your wanting and desire to help serve your serve your dad and just create a soft landing experience for him. That was the origin of all this, huh? That was it. That was really it. Um, there were, I mean, don't get me wrong. I had my own pain points with Windows, and I, I, I distinctly remember <laughs> playing Destiny Two at the time, hmm. and uh, I was playing on Windows and got the uh, the dreaded update pop up in the middle of a PvP match, and of course I yelled through the roof. I was so mad, but that <laughs> wasn't that was uh, that wasn't one of the like major triggers that was just one of the moments that i remember i i I guess the thing that's that that is most impactful to me is that you're scratching your own itch and the itch of your family members and it created a passion in you to go fix a particular problem which then just happened to resonate with a whole bunch of people across the internet yeah (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i i will say for at least for nobara's bits when that first started uh a lot of what i learned when i first started at red hat 
um, that did correlate with my work with Nobara in terms of, oh, well, I know how to do this now. I know how to do that now. I can go check, you know, if there's a problem with this and that. Like, uh, when I first started, for the first couple of years, I was working on our services team, which is, uh, it's not it's not customer service. It is uh, basically system D and D bus and hmm. every, most things under the sun that run as a service on the system. And uh, you learn a lot from that <laughs> within the last, uh, within the first couple of years. So can you take us under the hood? What is Novara? What is the operating system based on? What was the transition like from Antargos to, uh, how did all that work? How, what does that look like? Okay. Well, uh, first, obviously, we started. We switched from ArchBase to Fedora. Like I went Arch to Fedora. He went Intergo to Fedora. And the point from that was, a at that time, I was just I was working for Red Hat. That was our base. It was easy to use. Uh, It was easy for me for work. But it was at that time. It was still missing a couple of things that we wanted. Like we wanted to keep Mesa updated regularly. And I actually even pulled you know, the Mesa Vulcan drivers from Git, and we still do that in Novara. Um, just so we have, like, the latest and greatest fixes, as well as the latest and greatest bugs <laughs> um, for those Vulcan drivers. Uh, a couple other things, I think, um, switching pipe, Pulse to Pipewire was one thing, and Wayland, mm-hmm. you know, Fedora was one of the first, mm-hmm. was, I think, the first to officially switch to Wayland. Um so yeah, all of those changes that happened over the years were things, part of the reason that we chose Fedora as a base to begin with. Um, and then, like I said, the Vulcan driver bits was something that I did. And then little by little, I started having packages and bits and things here and there that um, that we either customized or that Fedora didn't have at the time. Like, for example, like GameScope was, a, was one, Mango HUD. Uh, a lot of the stuff that you, we do have now in Fedora at that time um we didn't have and so i would like pack pick them up package them here and there and then i was like you know i'm doing all this extra stuff on top of fedora might as well just go ahead and do my own distro because it was easier for me to maintain it's easier for my dad to use um these days fedora is really really good it's got pretty much a most of the things that we want like don't get me wrong we still have quite a few things in nobara that we package i think roughly maybe Anywhere between 75 to 100-ish packages that we put okay. on top of Fedora or modify from Fedora. But uh, it's it's far less now than it used to be. It's mm. just more of a, we customize the, the out-of-the-box out of experience a little bit differently. Very cool. So as, as someone who's gone from a Windows user to a Mac user to, uh, and then Arch Linux was was my first full-time, uh, I started out with, with uh and I thought it was Ander Gross, but you know everyone has their own way of pronouncing it. Um, I, I was very sad when when that community uh, went under, but uh, eventually, um, li- like yourself, I, I started spending more time with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And uh, so, as much as I enjoyed the experience of Arch and always crossing your fingers when you go to update packages, <laughs> um, you know, I switched over to to Fedora, and that's that's been my Linux uh, distro. Uh, of choice and for years it was <clears throat> buying a desktop that had two drives in it uh one ssd ran fedora and had all my day to day to day operations and then an inevitable inevitably inevitably i speak for a living can you tell it's getting late in the day <laughs> but inevitably that second ssd would be just a very small windows installed that had literally nothing on it except like steam and battle.net um <clears throat> big big starcraft 2 player and destiny 2 and and uh so nowadays it's it's really nice because that that windows partition still exists but basically never gets used and not just because i'm a dad and a full-time employee and all that kind of thing and play video games about once a month but because for the most part, running Fedora, vanilla Fedora, out of the box with GNOME and Proton running on top of Steam just works. And it is it is such a, a great experience to be able to load up a game in my Fedora distribution um, and not have to worry about anything. Um, 
and, and this is this has been like the solution that we've we've been looking for in the Linux community for so many years because <clears throat> there was things like bash scripts, there was things like wine, um, there's things like trying to. I even tried to like run Windows inside a virtual machine and do like GPU pass through, and that was just a nightmare, and it never worked the way it was yep. supposed to. I've been through all of that too. <laughs> it's almost the exact same steps, man. All of them. And, all of them. <laughs> and, and now we have Proton, um, and, and so we've we've kind of talked about it, and and I think maybe we did our audience a bit of a disservice. Let's let's take a step back and explain what is Proton uh, on, on the on the technical level. Uh, beyond just something that you install and it all of a sudden magically everything works. What is Proton doing underneath the hood? Okay, well, I will try to keep this as, <laughs> as brief as possible because there's quite <laughs> a bit to it. Um, Proton is a set of components, a set of libraries built around Wine as the main component. Uh, they allow translation for, you know, you direct X translation, uh, for your graphics side, as well as your audio translations and uh, even now VR support. So that's the base of it. You've got your Wine, you've got your DXVK and VKD3D for DirectX. You've got a couple of VR components. Um, I think they do they do some font replacement as well. And I think there's a couple of other minor components, but those are the big boys. Those are the, the main gist of it, right? So you have these components and you have a Proton, uh, the script called Proton, which is a Python script that loads all these components. And what it does is it does all of this. When Steam launches a game using Proton, it will first launch their application called Pressure Vessel. Pressure Vessel is like their modified version of Bubble Wrap. Think of it, you can think of it very much similar to like Flatpak. So they launch Pressure Vessel. Pressure Vessel runs a container and that container image is the Steam Linux runtime. And that is what the Steam Linux runtime is, is it's a basically a Debian image with modified packages that have been modified by Valve to you know, specifically for gaming. So Proton, when it's built, it's built against that runtime. And that's what they do. They launch, like when you launch a game, it launches press official, launches that runtime container, and then runs Proton and your game inside that container, which is kind of it kind of leads into my my side project Umu, but we'll we'll get into that. Very very cool. How long did it take you, if you don't mind me asking, from like from the time that you were like, "Hey, I can do this thing," till the time you had a thing? Uh, <laughs> with Proton, it was it's always evolving and always changing. The first couple sure. of years were just like. Oh, they're going to do it this way now. Oh, they're changing this. Oh, they're, they're changing that. I mean, we had at one point they were using Vagrant. They dropped using Vagrant. At one point they didn't have a runtime, and then they did have a runtime. <laughs> at one point, uh, they you know, they co they are constantly changing and evolving and updating things, which is good. It's a good thing. You always see like mm -hmm. brand new things being added to it. So we we have constantly had to learn how to do those things as we keep up with them with our fork, um, and that's pretty much it on the proton side and these days it's mostly maintaining and rebasing and adding things here and there but not so much as it was when they first i think they've kind of got their their base now that's like good and solid since since they first started is it um, getting easier to work with or is it getting is it getting more challenging uh, right now i think it's easier to work with until okay. they change something else that's major <laughs> <laughs> So, so I'm I'm probably one of the most vanilla Linux users you will ever meet, and so I always ask this question: What is the difference between Proton, the official version, and your fork? Okay, that is one. We, that's a common question that we get a lot, and I say we because it's actually like I am the creator, but we actually have a couple of people that work on it now, despite like besides myself, thankfully. You know, it's been five years, I would hope so. <laughs> right. um, but uh, what we do is we take vanilla Proton and we add the wine staging patches to it. We rebase wine staging on top of it. Um, we remove stuff from wine staging that's already been integrated into Proton, obviously, as part of the rebasing. And then we also add a couple of um, 
build options for FFmpeg and GStreamer for mm-hmm. allowing codecs to work that normally Valve couldn't ship. Because at the end of the day, like we're not a like we're not a company, we're not Valve, you know, and we're also not shipping anything. People have to go to our you know our GitHub and download it themselves. So we're not providing anything that way. So with that being said, we enable those codecs so that video playback in in specific games runs better or is able to play, whereas vanilla Proton might not be able to. Hmm. So those are the two major things: is wine staging and video play video codec uh, enablement. And then there's like a handful of patches on top of that that we add that are just like maybe game specific fixes that haven't made it in yet, or hmm. um, like we still we still have an FSR patch, which is, it's, it, Gamescope has FSR built into it, but if you don't want to use Gamescope, you can use our environment variables to enable FSR and GE Proton builds. We still carry that. We've been trying to get rid of it slowly but surely, but it's it's just like, it never dies. <laughs> Every time that I think, okay, we're going to retire this now, somebody comes along and rebases it, and I'm like, okay, so here we go. <laughs> Can you talk uh, about some of what your favorite games are? What are some of the things that you have gotten to work uh, on Proton or got to work on the underneath? Or maybe it isn't necessarily even the playability of the game that was fun. It was solving the problem to get it to run on Linux was fun. What comes to mind? You know, I have almost, almost I think, like 2,000-something games in my Steam library now. And it's <laughs> literally because I swear I probably spend more time fixing games than actually playing them. <laughs> like, is that fun I, for you like do you like that oh yeah i love it i love it it's like it's it's like solving a really crazy ridiculous serious puzzle um mm. and you know sometimes I, i'm not nearly as technical in terms of uh the wine code as per se the people from code weavers like i know a bunch of people that work for code weavers and they're the ones who do like a lot of the heavy heavy lifting in terms of that stuff but i mean every once in a while i can go in there and i can patch something or i can figure something out or mi- figure out a missing um, you know, wine tricks or something like that. Like I'm, I know stuff, but I don't know, no stuff. Uh, so like figuring that stuff out is really, really cool to me. Uh, as far as games that I do regularly play, uh, Final Fantasy 14 or WoW, whichever one is suiting my mind at the time. I love both of them. I played them both for a very long time. Uh, Diablo 4 has been fantastic. Mm. I, I love top-down uh, ARPGs, like your Diablo, your Path of Exile. Uh, you know, Last Epoch was awesome when that drops. Um, I still play that every once in a while. But those are kind of my go-tos. Uh, I used to play MOBAs not so much these days. I, I will every once in a while play some Dota. Um, MTG Arena, Magic the Gathering. I, I love mm. Magic the Gathering. It's been a lot of fun lately. Uh, yeah, those are my major ones. Can you talk a little bit about what it looks like to troubleshoot a game? So somebody opens a bug report, they they bring your attention to the fact that, hey, this game isn't working. You say, I want to dig into that. And so you add one more on top of your 2,000 games that are in your Steam library <laughs> and start up game number 2001 so that you can figure out why this game isn't working. You're about to jump into the, the puzzle. What does that look like from that point on? I mean, I assume you start by trying to play it and recreate the issue. But then can you walk us kind of through how you troubleshoot something like that? Hmm. Uh, I can give some basics. I will say right up front that a lot of the times if a game has been broken a very long time uh, and Valve hasn't fixed it, chances are I'm probably also not going to be able to fix it because they've got a whole team of guys dedicated to that. But every once in a while you'll have you'll find some, some easy low-hanging fruit, you know. Um, a lot of the times it's basic like wine tricks. So... Let's say somebody provides a proton log, right? And I go through looking through the proton log and I see, oh, it's not loading, or it's looking for D3D compiler 47.dll. That's not something that's normally shipped and that's why it's missing. And so that's kind of low hanging fruit. If I look through the log and I see that wine is looking for that and it's missing, then I can go, oh, okay, and these wine tricks, D3D compiler 47. Uh, mm-hmm. That uh, knowing which wine tricks comes hand in hand with just working with wine tricks for a really really long time. Um, okay, like a lot of people that are fresh to wine, they're not really going to know all of the different verbs that wine tricks has. 
<laughs> Whereas if you've worked with it for a long time, you're like, oh, this needs WP9 or WP10, or this needs, uh, you know, D3D compiler 47, or this needs VC run 2017. Like, I'm just lift, listing verbs off the top of my head now. But um, that that part comes hand in hand, which is doing it repetitively over a long period of time. Okay, that's so just the experience. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's the basic gist of it. Is you get a log, you look at a log. If you see something's missing, uh, maybe see if there's a wine tricks that resolves it. And then the other part also is more of like a hit and miss with uh, the video playback stuff, the media foundation stuff. Uh, one of my favorite games that I was able to get working is Catherine Classic, and I've literally never played the game. The reason it was my favorite to fix is because I f managed to get it working after it not working for what, like four years, mm. four or five years of me knowing about it anyway. But basically the way that happened is somebody had reported a bug on wise origin and they said, Hey, this happens, but we have these wine tricks that you can apply that fix wise origin. And they were wine tricks that I hadn't used before or a combination of them I hadn't used before. And so I went and I was like, oh, well, now I wonder if that works on this game. And it worked on another one. It was, I can't remember the other, the name of the other one, but they were all kind of along the same lines of like uh, the anime esque cutscene type games. And so I was like, okay, well, what if we could try this on Catherine Classic? So I went and I tried it on Catherine Classic. I was like, it works. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, so, that was like the big hallelujah moment. Oh my God. <laughs> so monkey see, monkey do is a valid troubleshooting technique is what I'm hearing. Yeah. As long as you kind of have a ballpark idea of what it's dealing with. Like, you know, I'm not going to go apply D3D compiler 47 for something that's having a video issue because they're not related at all. Mm -hmm. So, but if, you know, if it's video related, I know off the bat, oh, maybe it's quartz, maybe it's direct play, maybe it's direct music, maybe it's audio with D sound, maybe it's WMP9 or WMP10. Those are all media related. And I know just I can go trying all of those to see if something sticks. Mm. Okay. All, all the usual suspects, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> So if if I'm if I'm in our audience and I'm listening to this, it's like okay, that's great. But uh, some of the games we've mentioned aren't exactly triple A, top of the line, brand new from the studio. Right. Uh, so if if I'm in our audience, I'm probably thinking, okay, yeah, that's great for maybe a 15 year old game that I'm one of three people that still play. But what about triple A support? What what has that been like coming down either from Steam or, or from the studios themselves? Is it getting better? Honestly, like 90% of the time, a lot of the new games that release that are AAA games either work fairly okay or they maybe need a couple of Vulcan changes or Vulcan driver updates. That's pretty much it. As long as as long as it doesn't have something crazy like kernel level anti cheat, usually you fire it up and it works and you're like, Oh, that's cool. Awesome. Um, the most, I think the still to this day, the two biggest things are, uh, video playback and codec support and, um, you know, whether or not it has kernel level anti-cheat. Hmm. Very good. Um, can you talk a little bit are, uh, about specific tweaks or configurations that allow you to get the best performance? If somebody's trying to set up a gaming specific machine or buying a machine specifically to set up for gaming, are there specific things that you'd say, always do this, never do that, make sure to have this installed, make sure to get rid of that? Well, if we're starting on the hardware level, make sure your hardware is supported on Linux. Like that's just that's like that's an easy given. If you're going to build something that's targeted at Linux, you want the hardware that is supported on Linux. Um, you know, these days Nvidia drivers are getting better, but I still see people every you know every so often that have problems here and there. And I will say until their drivers are like fully comfortably easily working on Wayland, I think AMD is still the better pick there. So as far as hardware support, um, go Team Red. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. You know, I, I would love, don't get me wrong, NVIDIA, they have some fantastic hardware themselves. They have a lot of awesome, like, don't get, uh, love it or hate it, NV Inc. is a thing, you mm -hmm. know, and, and 
their encoder works better than AMD's. And like, we have our open source Vapi, which works great now. Like it works great now, but it didn't uh, a couple of years ago. That was you know Vapi now is fairly recently working really well. Um, I mean, to be fair, I have I have one rig with with each one. One has a, a, a trusty NVIDIA GPU, and it has its purposes. And yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm pretty partial to my uh, my Ryzen CPU and my AMD GPU. Yep, yeah, <laughs> it's it's just really nice that the, the AMD stuff works just out of the box. You don't have to deal with any, you know, DKMS or or slash AK mm-hmm. mods uh, external kernel modules. Um, so th- I would say that, and I think the other biggest thing that a lot of people end up is- having issues with is, believe it or not uh mediatek wi-fi oh yeah yeah yeah. don't remind me mediatek has been a big uh within the last couple of years because of amd pushing you know their their new ryzen chips a lot of companies have been pairing it with mediatek instead of the intel chips and you know i will say it the the intel at least the ax200 ax ax210s those chips have been really really reliable uh so if you're having and mediatek i've i almost daily i see media tech problems and they are in a better state now but if you chances are if you go and buy new brand new amd hardware it's going to come with a newer media tech chip and it's going to need either like kernel support or have some kind of kernel patch that's needed so on the hardware side those are the major things make sure your your hardware is supported by linux um on the software side one you don't have to be running the latest and greatest OS, but make sure your kernel is up to date. You don't need it. I mean, you don't need a bleeding edge RC kernel, but just make sure you're on like the latest actual release that most distros are running. Like, you know, Fedora is running 6.11 right now, and that's pretty much the same for other ones across the board that keep their kernel up to date. Same thing with Mesa. Uh, If you're on AMD or Intel, you want the latest Mesa driver stack. So those are the two major things. Make sure your kernel's up to date. Make sure Mesa's up to date. And obviously, NVIDIA, make sure the NVIDIA driver stack's up to date. Um, those are the three major things in terms of gaming. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty much it in a nutshell. You don't have to do anything super special. There are, you know, don't get me wrong, there are, like, super tweaks and nitpicks here and there that, you know, if, if I was back using Arch, I would probably still be, like, looking into that stuff. But... You don't need them on a daily basis. It's going to get you to your 0.002% performance increase. Like, that's not necessary. Generally, just... You, at least you I, said, I don't think they're necessary. You said that you start your dad started out on Windows and you guys went towards Linux. Do you think these days it's easier to get games up and running on Linux or is it still kind of fighting in upwards battle? I, I ask that just because you're not the first person that I've heard that just aside from the whole windows linux thing has just went yeah but my goal here is just to play games and Mm -hmm. in in pursuit of that goal and that goal alone wound up on a linux-based operating system i think it's easy by far like much easier than it used to be oh my gosh man most of these days like pretty much any major distro that you pick you just you know (laughs) fire it up load it onto a load it onto your hard drive and uh, install the game that you want to play and play it. There's not really any difficulty in it. Even older, like even if we go at least a year old Mesa, you're still going to be able to get an enjoyable out of the box gaming experience. The only times again that that ends up being an issue is either one, if you have hardware that doesn't run or isn't supported on Linux, or two, you don't have drivers that are up to date, and. Um, yeah, that's pretty. Or you know, obviously, or if the game has kernel level anti cheat, I hammer on that because that's a big problem. Yes, and and that's probably one of the biggest complaints that I've seen with gaming on Linux over the last couple of years. Which is a nice switch from the years where it's like this doesn't work and there's no way to fix it. But uh, yeah, definitely keep an eye out on the uh, on the whole anti cheat thing. Uh, a lot of studios will still just automatically ban you um, in those uh, scenarios and depending on the studio or the the mood of the person that you reach out to at support, uh, it's it's often hard to un- get that account un- unbanned. Yeah, yeah, that's it's really unfortunate. I will say um, right off the bat that uh, Destiny was one of the first ones to do that, right? Like before yeah. any, like before even, 
Steam Deck was a big thing. They they mm -hmm. and they just were barely reaching out for Steam Deck support. They right off the bat they were just like, no, no Steam Deck support, no Wine support, no Linux support. You want to play? You play Windows. And we're like, okay, well, I just won't give you my money then. Bye. <laughs> like, yeah, that, that's that's, that's the only decision I can make there. Long term, though, so you got to feel like that's going to bite com bite games. You hope, you wish, you hope that it catches on. You know, like. It just it depends on how many people get frustrated. I was just mm -hmm. I was one out of many, but for that one person that's frustrated, there's also X amount of people that are just carrying on their daily lives and just don't care. Yeah. So is is is, is the target audience of your product uh, of of your of your project? Um, I've got to say just how much nicer it's been over the last several years to be able to boot up my Fedora machine, launch Steam. After I spent all day in Firefox working on 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 work things, to then just launch Steam and play a game, just pick a game out of my library it's and so go. Nice. It's it's, so it's, nice. it's been so fantastic, <laughs> and and my insides were just twisting as you were talking about. Oh yeah, I just I didn't I never even played this game, but I troubleshooted it, and it was so much fun. It's like I'm the exact opposite. It's like if I click launch game, <laughs> the last thing I want to have to dig through is is error messages is like i do this for a living so so on on behalf of everyone that uses <laughs> proton and proton <laughs> ge thank you for what you and your team do but i, I want to kind of shift the conversation to the future what's what's coming like you you hinted at vr which seemed to get really popular there for a bit and, and i think some of the hype has kind of died down a little but what, what's coming in in the future of gaming and specifically uh gaming on fedora or on, uh, sorry, gaming on on Linux in particular. Well, as far as VR goes, VR has already been there. It's been there for quite a while. It's just it wasn't there on GNOME because GNOME didn't have DRM leasing, so that's that's on GNOME. <laughs> sorry about that, GNOME lovers. <laughs> but uh, yeah, VR VR works. VR is <laughs> fine. Um, I would say in the future, what I am working on and what I just gave a talk on at Ubuntu Summit is our new project called umu and i did like i said i did a whole talk on that the gist of it is after summit last year um well i'll start at summit last year i met up with strider from lutris who i've I'm, i've known hmm. Strider for many years we do scale together uh, but we also met up with a couple of people from heroic we met up with eric from valve uh, there was a couple, there was a couple, there was a small handful for the, the gaming track that they had la last year. And we got to talking about how Valve uses Pressure Vessel to run Proton and how that's really useful because what it allows them to do is it allows them to run the games the exact same way on a stable targeted platform, regardless of what operating system it's on. Because at the end of the day, it's just running within a container on a containerized environment. So, you, you know, nothing changes there. And I said, hey, you know, it'd be really useful if we could use this outside of Steam. And Eric was pretty much, he goes, well, you can, and we have it documented. And I looked at it, I was like, what? It's been like four years and nobody's done this? So that got the, got the, the gears grinding. And once we got back from Summit, we all formed a group called OWC Open Wine Components. And we've got quite a big list of people in there now. We're all working together on different things, and we're all from different projects. But it's for Umu, which is our back end. And what we did is we took Pressure Vessel and made it work outside of Steam for non-Steam games. So that was the one major part. The second part is we created a database to keep track of these non-Steam games, issued them all Umu IDs, and basically allow we've made it to where Proton is able to uh get fed this id and then pull up a fix for it if a fix is in the database and then provide and then like apply the fix it's the same thing that ge proton has done for many years but it just allows us to, allows it to do it for non-steam games as well um it's also convenient for if you have the non-steam version of a game that's also on steam so hmm. like say for example you have red dead redemption 2 on the epic game store okay uh that is also on steam and in steam inside proton there are uh specific patched in fixes into proton uh, into wine and those fixes will only trigger if the steam game id is set to steam's version of red uh, the steam game id of red dead redemption 2. 
So if you go to, you know, let's say you were to add the Epic Game Store version to Steam as a non-Steam game and launch it with Proton, you're still not going to have those fixes kick in because they need the Steam game ID. So this is this is this is really <laughs> an incredible story. Like, so you <laughs> you you're employed by Red Hat to make open source software for Red Hat. Your passion is is working on on Proton and game compatibility. You went to Ubuntu Summit where you met up with people <laughs> working on what some might argue is a competitive project. And you use that as an opportunity to further the community and discover where there are opportunities to work together and further things and take what other people are doing and make it more available out to people in the community. That's really quite a, that's a really cool story, man. You know, I will, I will say this about the summit that all of the people at canonical are great. All my friends and family that are, well, not family. I don't have any family that are over there, but I have friends that work like for brothers. canonical and, uh, the thing about Ubuntu Summit, it is very community-based. They invite people that are working on all different kinds of you know, projects everywhere. It's not full corporate. You know, When we have booths, it's not all corporate, all business. It's literally people that are just working on different, really cool projects. Like, um, you know, I've car, if System76, they're, here, they're based here in Denver. Uh, mm -hmm. I am I'm friends with Carl. I've talked to him many times. And when he was at Summit, they were giving a talk on the Cosmic Desktop. And they were giving a talk more so about the things that go on under the hood on Cosmic Desktop and the things they had to fix and the things that they had to do with the compositor. And there's that's just one example of a lot of really cool talks that go on over there. And to be able to talk to him about that stuff and also Victoria, who's working with him on that stuff, um it's a really cool opportunity same thing they also mm. had they had a whole booth for asahi linux uh so mm. i was able to go and talk to the asahi guys and uh, that's also where i saw the you know tobias was working the the booth there and he showed me the snapdragon system running it running proton on arm and i'm like okay you know that's i see you went to someone as a an opportunity to really uh, step like get outside of your box and learn something new and something really really cool so i will say like yeah. kudos, kudos to canonical for that that's very awesome and kudos to you for using that as kind of a launching point <laughs> to do something even cooler yet that's very neat that's a very cool story although i'm i'm thrilled at the fact that uh the answer to a lot of these gaming on Linux problems is containers as, as someone who works in enterprise <laughs> open source, as part of my role and as part of my passion, it's it's great to see that the solution to playing video games is is also containers. <laughs> yeah, I was I was super excited when I you know when I figured all of that out. Like uh, a lot of people, my my uphill battle for a really long time was people running Proton, uh, well running trying to run their games with Proton but not using the container. They would just assign the Wine version of Proton, or you know they would they wouldn't use a container or pressure vessel or anything at, at all. And when you do that, you're not using the Steam Linux runtime, which is what Proton is built on. So obviously there's going to be, you know, uh, dependency problems or like, like library version problems and things that come up that are just not, they're not working right because you need that containerized environment for it to work properly. Hmm. So I'm really glad that we were able to do that and, you know, obviously get Umu out there to, be able to do it also for non-steam games which is super super cool so the one question that i ask every single episode is if i'm a contributor or if i want to become a contributor how can i get involved with your project uh the the absolute easiest way for proton ge or ge proton is my discord uh, i have that listed on the github uh, you know, love it or hate it, some people absolutely despise Discord. I, I I hear you. Trust me, I've heard it the last five years. But for me, that is the easiest way. I always have Discord open. I always see what's going on in there. I wake up, I see Discord notifications. I go to sleep, I see Discord notifications. Like, it's always open on my desktop. And for me to see things there is just easy. Um, mm -hmm. For Umu, you can... You know, we have the issue tracker open. You can open an issue or you can, you know, straight up open a, a pull request if you have a fix for something. 
and yeah, that one's straight up standard GitHub stuff. Like, go on GitHub, open an issue, or open a ticket, or open a PR. Awesome! I am very excited to to hear uh, hear about Umu as it develops. Uh, and if if you're interested, we'll have links to Proton GE, Nobara, Umu, and, and more in the show notes, uh, as well as chapter markers and some links to uh, not only our Matrix Room but uh, some other useful things like uh, so, uh, like uh, Fedora swag. So if you need a Fedora T-shirt, we should all have a Fedora T-shirt. Um, you can uh, check the show notes for those links. Uh, so, uh, as, as we wrap up, uh, glorious and any, any closing thoughts, anything you want to leave our audience with? Um, honestly, just thank you for the support over the last five years. I've had an incredible amount of support from a lot of the community and it's just, it grows more and more every year. And I just, I really appreciate everyone out there that's, that's been involved. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. No uh, closing thoughts. Uh, I would, I would, I would echo sentiments of gratitude. I appreciate what you put on this planet. I appreciate the passion with w which you do it, and I appreciate the fact that you take time out of your workday to go communicate with other people and build relationships in the community to make sure that you're able to keep doing it. Awesome. <laughs> Thank well, you. Now I got to go finish up the show notes and boot up my Windows. Or, geez, wow, that was. I was quite the slip. Oh no! <laughs> I need to finish the show notes and then go boot up my my Fedora machine, my my gaming rig, and because now I want to play Red Dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have birria tacos that have been uh, slow cooking in the cooker for the last four hours, so that's what's on my Ooh. menu. <laughs> uh, Thanks a lot for making the Red time. Red Dead Redemption Two sounds perfect. Let's let's do it. <laughs> I, I, I'm in Kansas City. It's it's like a four hour drive. I'll I'll be there as soon as I can. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you very much for making the time, man. Not a problem. Thank you for the invite. It's it's been a pleasure. Yeah, this was great. And uh, and don't be a stranger. Any, anytime you have some updates, let us know, and we'll we'll have you back on the show. Cool. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. See Definitely. ya. All right, folks. Thank you all so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, we'll be. Uh, I think we'll be live in two weeks. Um, so I thank you all for being patient. Uh, we've had a couple of pre-recorded, but uh, a few of us have been traveling and work changes, all all the things. Uh, so thank you for joining us, uh, e even though this was pre-recorded. So in two weeks, Noah, I think you and I will be live, and we're we're tracking down a guest. But the topic is uh, is is already decided upon. I don't know if you all know this, but this is a huge internet secret. Don't tell anyone. But Fedora Linux forty one and all of the spins and labs and additions have just released Fedora Linux uh, 41. What? And so episode 41 mm -hmm. of the Fedora podcast will be about Fedora Linux 41. That's it's almost clever. as if we it's almost as Somebody's if Somebody's thinking. About it. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll be talking about Fedora Linux 41 and some of the new features, not just on the GNOME edition, but on some of the other editions and spins. Uh, so definitely catch us live. Uh, we are now on YouTube, Twitch, uh, PeerTube, and uh, anywhere you can get your audio podcast. So plenty of places to to catch the Fedora, uh, the Fedora podcast. Uh, but please like like the episode uh, that helps grease the uh, the search engines to help uh, other people find our show subscribe so you get notified anytime we go live or produce new content um and, and tell a friend if you don't have any friends join the uh, fedora podcast um matrix channel and some of the other fedora matrix rooms uh, and find all sorts of friends uh in fact i wonder if we have a gaming room if we don't have a gaming room we should make one because talking about I, I got to tell you, I, I know we're wrapping, but Tom, hearing you talk about how passionate you are about fixing these issues so other people can game just makes me more excited to go and game because like I've I've <laughs> met some of the developers now. It's like I'm I'm, I'm going to shut up now and end the episode so I can go play a game before bed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Noah, where, where can folks find you? And, and then we'll wrap, I promise. AskNoahShow.com, Tuesday, 6 p.m. 6 Central. Awesome. So Tuesdays are all about the Linux. So definitely catch, catch the Ask Noah show. Call in, give them a hard time, tell them you heard about uh, the Ask Noah show on this show. Um, and uh, with that said, we'll, we'll wrap up today's episode and we'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks, everybody.